Welcome to this episode of Adobe Live. Uh, we're here learning some pixel art with Jeremy Lord, bit by bit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah bit <laughs> by bit indeed. Um, so yeah, so today we're just going to kind of look at um, my process of creating pixel art, mm -hmm. um, covering sort of, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone, being trying a sort of a different medium, um, and all the technical things like image interpolation, uh, dithering, color choice, selection, and all that. So yeah, it um, should be really fun. It was awesome fun. Check it out. Hey guys, and welcome to Adobe APAC Live. I'm Flynn and I'm here with Jeremy Lord. What is up? Hey, hey man, good to be here again. I'm excited. Really excited, yeah. We've got this whole illustration thing happening today. <laughs> yep. Um, welcome to everybody in the chat. Um, feel free to jump into the chat room and ask questions. We're going to be here for about an hour. Um, and we actually did a little bit of stuff on the live stream. Well, you did. I got to sit up the back, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and you actually kicked off our first creative challenge. Yes, I did. Yeah, so very first creative challenge, um, part one of four. Yep. Um, where we're going to be going through a brief. Um, basically just going through basics of, of digital to, I'm uh, sorry, analog to digital illustration. So taking a sketch, scanning it in, and then getting it ready to put some color into it in Photoshop. Yeah. That was awesome. So it's like a little half an hour um, and you do each step. And then at the end, you're going to come up with a beautiful illustration, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but so what are we going to spend our hour on today? All right. So um, been here a few times now. Yeah. Um, so trying to sort of think about like new ways to, to new things to talk about, um, even just in sort of a broad sense in, you know, what I'm doing as an illustrator. Um, it's nice to kind of switch things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds really cliche and corny, but like stepping out of your comfort zone and all uh -huh. that kind of stuff. Um, so today um, we're going to look at pixel art. Yes. Um, because yeah, That's awesome. I'm a gaming fan. Uh, I'm retro. I'm an 80s kid. And so like all the things click together for me with pixel art. Um, but so we're going to take a look at that and I'll talk a little bit about kind of stepping out of your comfort zone, but still being within the bounds of stuff that is familiar to you. So yeah. not really stepping out of your comfort zone. Right. Um, but more to the point, I think is, is also going to be this idea of like, so there's going to be some technical, some theory behind it, but, um, yeah, it's something that I really love working with and mm. something that's relatively new for me as well. So there's not heaps of stuff on my website just yet. Um, but so this yeah, is new. So this is all fresh. Yeah, this is like like a month ago. I was like, hey, how about Pixel Art? Yeah. yeah. Now it's right and here. So, and now Adobe, expert, Adobe Live. Not at all, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so cool. Like it's so exciting to be doing something like different. And like yeah. I've, I've obviously we've been chatting about you coming on and just watching all, all your artwork come through. I'm like, oh, this is so cool because it's your style, but it's a different way to do yeah. it. And yeah, it's been really awesome. But um, so yeah, please jump in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Um, so we're streaming live from Sydney at the moment um, and feel free to ask your questions. We actually had a question in the last segment that we thought we could cover, um, which was by Festus, um, talking about how you saw Paul Tranny, which is on the Behance team over in the US, um, was using a Moleskin Miracle sketch pad. Um, we thought we just said, hey, well, why don't we kick off by talking about that real quick? Yeah, so um, I've, I've never actually sort of tried one myself, no, um, but I've heard a lot about it. Um, I think it sounds like a really cool thing to, to try out and I'd love to, to try one out. Mm. Um, unfortunately or fortunately or who cares, um, <laughs> my process is almost entirely digital yep. these days. Um, I will even go so far and you guys will see this today where I'll do a sketch digitally. Um, so my sketchbook is kind of like forlornly sitting on a table kind of waving at me. He's just like, Hi. do you remember me? <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> bit, which is, uh, you know, a bit sad seeing as I'm classically trained, but at the same time, it's like, well, this is who I am now, so yeah, it's fine. It's a digital world. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so hello to Scott. What's up, Tali? Georgina from Brisbane. Nice to have you here. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, but why don't we why don't we kick off and just um, show people how they can um, submit this stuff for the creative challenge? Because if yeah. they're if you guys are interested in this, um, you might be interested in the creative challenge, which we're going to do over the next couple of weeks as well. So do you have that? I do, yeah. Just a shout out to Scott G as well, saying loves loves my T-shirt. That's one of mine, actually. Um, which, if you go to my website, you can see. Um, so the uh, creative challenge. Um, one of the things that we'd like for whoever sort of watched uh, is watching the replay to sort of contribute, um, take a drawing, do the scanning, go through the steps that we went through. 
um, and you can submit um, at this link that will be um, when you log in onto um, Adobe APAC Live. Yeah, you'll see this, and basically there'll be a little brief here. Um, and you can just basically choose the file and enter sort of a caption. And next week, when I go through part two of the Creative Challenge, I'll give you guys some tips and feedback at the end of the stream uh, on how, like, hey, cool, you did this really well, and maybe you can think about using this tool for that. That would speed up the process, so on and so forth. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really looking forward to seeing um, what people submit. Yeah, awesome. You can actually also submit your website or your Behance portfolio or something. Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll jump into that. And then to finish everything off, um, maybe I'll do this last one with you, but to finish everything off, we'll do a bit of a portfolio review as well. Yep. So that's in a couple of weeks. Um, so do check that out. If you're watching this, you don't know what we're talking about, um, tomorrow head along to the YouTube channel um, and everything will be there available with all the information. Yeah, awesome. Let's do some pixel art. Let's I'm do so some excited. pixel art. So, all right, so first things, I think there, there's kind of like two main things that I kind of want to chat about today. Um, these are some examples of pixel art, and as you can see, they're all really small because I'm working with pixels, and mm -hmm. so you know, it's all quite sort of microscopic. Um, so these are all just kind of, you know, examples of stuff that I've done um, at this stage working with, with pixel art. There's a few more as well that will come up as we kind of look at them. Um, working with potions, obviously, like potions. Gaming. Mana. This is mana yeah, for sure. This is mana. This, this particular, like, kind of reminds me of Diablo, like original yeah, Diablo. Yeah. Well, this is it, like, you know, Diablo 1 and Diablo 2. Um, I'm super inspired also by a kind of an indie game called Hyperlight Drifter. Okay. Which is really, really cool. Super, super difficult game, really unforgiving, um, high learning curve, but visually just, yeah, stunning. Really cool. Love right. the colors, pixel art. Um, it's one of those things, I think, where it's just this idea that... Um, We've kind of come full circle, and now it's we're using new machines to make older things look old and have yeah. that old. Yeah. Aesthetic. Whereas the old machines yeah. just that's how they did it. That's and all they had to play with, like, right? We're having to force yeah. it to be the old way, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today I'll be going through kind of this one, um, and and going through my process and how I build this and the layers that I'm using and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, before we kind of jump into that, I just wanted to talk about a few different kind of more, I guess, theory-based things. Great. Um, so for me, this is really kind of stepping out of my comfort zone. And it's what I call like stepping out of your comfort zone, but staying in your trackies and slippers because it's not completely out of your comfort zone. Right. Like you're still taking a part of home with you outside of your comfort zone. Okay. Um, so what this is, is basically like this pixel art for me is from a technical standpoint, is the complete diametric opposite of what I normally do. Right. So what I've been doing up to this point is super smooth lines, really high definition work, working really hard to hide every single pixel in the image. Right, because right, your artwork looks really smooth. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. so really nice, smooth, buttery, sharp lines, no aliasing, which is where you get this like little crenellation on the side of artwork. Mm. Um, back in the days when it used to be low res. Um, so that that's the first kind of thing for me that's like completely different now i'm working in the opposite way where i have to see all the pixels mm. and i can't put lines necessarily where i'd want them to be and they're not smooth and so that's kind of interesting um the second thing i think that's really um sort of a big opposite for me is the fact that we're using pixels mm -hmm. and we're using pixels to show those pixels changes so many different things um and we'll see this as we go along, but size doesn't matter anymore. Right. Because, the, I mean, like, and I mean that by file size. Because, <laughs> yeah, because you're working at a file that's that's not, like, I'll give you guys an example. Um, this image here, as you can see, is tiny on my screen. That's its actual size. It's 16 pixels by 16. Right. But I can zoom in on this as far as I want, and you guys will see the outlines of this. But if I took this and printed it onto, like, the harbor bridge mm -hmm. it would not lose any resolution because the image is resolution right yeah it's okay. a bit weird like it's it's kind of like quantum photoshop yes i've gone so deep into the image that things are now enormous again it's like a world within a world yeah exactly things don't obey the rules that we normally have to use with dpi and all this kind of stuff it's like and it's it becomes really really interesting as well when we talk about selections mm -hmm. um, and painting pixels and all that where Essentially, my artwork requires a lot of layering, which I will still use layers here just so I can edit the colors in the same way that I normally do. Um, but I could do all of this without 
creating a single layer. Right. And I would still be able to select and edit in maybe a tiny little bit more slowly, but the way I would normally work, that would be impossible right. for me to do that. Yeah. Um, and the other main thing that's massively different for me to do is this guy. I'm not using a Wacom to do any of this. Where did you get that mouse? Did you just like have to buy it on the way here? Oh, like? yeah, no, I, like <laughs> I, I bought it a little while ago to play Diablo. Right. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, like I've just like setting my Wacom aside has just kind of been this huge thing for me where yeah. it's like, Again, like I will still do like sketches with my Wacom. So that obviously this drawing has been done with my Wacom. Mm. Trying to draw with a mouse like this is a little bit sort of brain surgery with a brick. It's not not amazing quality. Um, it's possible, but and I think you had Jess Rye in here last week talking about we some did. drawing with yeah, a mouse Jesse, as well. Yeah. Um, so it's doable, but the the really cool thing is, is like yeah, painting with pixels is like you don't need to be precise, and mm. so you can just use a mouse. Yeah, Jesse was talking about when he started that he was even using the trackpad to like fake um, fake the depth, like in the yeah. curves and everything. So he'd do a line, which is just a straight up line, and then he'd have to come back in with the eraser and kind yeah. of try to taper it off. Um, yeah. which he did not recommend, um, <laughs> yeah. but he said it is possible. Definitely, I think definitely having a Wacom, and you could totally do this with a Wacom as well, and it might be a bit easier, but it's also very achievable with a mouse. So yeah, so my way of working has just completely been flipped on its head, Yeah. simply because I'm now working in this way where the pixels are the hero. Pixels are the hero. Yeah. I love it. Um, hey, uh, yeah, I love Diablo too, JB. Um, <laughs> hi, Deanne from New Zealand. Nice to have you here. All right. So, uh, let's get a little bit kind of technical. Okay, um, I'm ready. Because we're going to make Photoshop do stuff that it was built for, but I think people have forgotten that this was the kind of the original use of it. Right. Um, and we're going to go in and kind of use the, the core ingredients of any digital art, which is pixels. Okay. Um, in order to do that, the first thing that we kind of want to do is work with image interpolation, which sounds real kind of like nerdy, like... Sounds techy as. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it's a bit kind of like 90s and 80s, you know, when computers were massive, but mm -hmm. this is going to make all the difference. So image interpolation basically means if I'm doing something like this, for instance, um, so again, I'm this image here is just a 1,000 pixels by a 1,000, um, if I am using, uh, let's see, I might have set my computer to the wrong settings, but let's give it a stab anyways. Uh, yeah, so we've got this happening here. Mm -hmm. Normally what happens with a program like Photoshop is this happens, right? So the difference is we get this aliasing here and because Photoshop is smart and because people have you know grown more advanced than aliasing and 8-bit machines and all this kind of stuff photoshop has created this kind of brush which is a that's a well, that's a soft edge brush but if i did use a hard edge brush from a distance it looks like a nice hard edge but as i get closer you notice that there is actually a little bit of an edge there mm -hmm. Um, that's the default setting of Photoshop because you want something smooth. So we're going to trick Photoshop into not having that. So we're going to go into our settings, so Command-K, open this up, and where the image interpolation is always on bicubic automatic, which will give us that kind of soft edge to it, which we don't want. No, now pixel art, right? We're now going to go into nearest neighbor preserve hard edge. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's going to make all the difference to our artwork. Um, we can do this at a bunch of different stages. We don't necessarily need to do it here. Um, so if you don't want to sort of screw with too many settings, you can leave it. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to leave it as well because we can very much achieve what we want a little bit later on. Does that uh, software change, does that change all instances of Photoshop when you open it on that computer? Yes. Or is it just that that's, file? That's the, no, no, it's that, those are the settings of Photoshop now. That's is what you're going to get everywhere you go. Okay. So, so you got to remember. Starting, yeah, exactly. Okay. If you're working with a client and you need to make it smooth and you're like, oh shit, I forgot to put it in um, by cubic. You're gonna to have to redo the whole file again. Mm -hmm. It gets a little bit finicky. So that's why I'm saying, like, yeah, if if you're kind of keen to play it safe, don't do it in the settings. There are other ways of doing it later on okay, that cool. you can kind of play around with. Um, so there's that. So we're gonna look also at our brush and our selections. So our selections here 
Normally what a selection will do is it'll have this anti-aliasing, mm -hmm. which means that you don't get this kind of like crenellation again. So if I have that ticked, which is ticked by default, and I make that same fill, you'll notice that there is that kind of blurry soft edge where there's sort of like four different colors of blue there. Yep. I don't want that. I want it to be nice and hard and pixely like that. So I'm going to untick that. That's step one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Step two is I'm not going to use a brush. I'm going to use the pencil rather than the brush. So I'm going to click on that and I am going to set that to one pixel wide. So when I zoom in onto my file here, you'll see that my pixel grid starts to show. Okay, that's always on by default. Mm -hmm. I can turn it on even more in Photoshop if I want to, so I can see where all of my pixels are. What's that shortcut? Uh, so that's command... Uh, Quote? Python? Python? I don't know. Right. The, okay. Just the one the one dash. The one dash. Under under air quotes. Okay. Yeah. We're, cool. we're super smart here. We know what we're talking about. We know about. what's going on. We practice this. Um, so yeah, so I can do that. You might, your grid might look a bit different to mine. So I've set my grid in this sense to be the grid every single pixel so that I mm -hmm. can see where all the pixels are going to go. In order to do that, again, I need to open up my settings, so Command K, uh, and go to uh, Guides, Grids, and Slices. And you'll notice that down here in my grid, I've got a grid every one pixel with subdivisions of one. So that's going to mean that every single one of my pixels forms a grid. And that's probably standard, right? Um, I don't think so. I think right. it, it depends on what you kind of stuff you're doing. But I mean, if you're working on a super massive file that's got, you know, like 3,000 by 4,000 pixels, you probably don't want something that's going to look like this staring at you in the face the whole time. Yeah, OK. So that's really more just kind of for precision work like this. Um, so um, Georgina was just asking if we um, could show that original setting again. For? I think the first one, just to just, yep. to, just okay, that so one that you sort of said you weren't going to turn on right now. Yep, so that's in that here. Again. So that's when you go to your preferences, which is in here. So Command-K. So we go to that. It's the first one in general, and then it says into image interpolation. So we just want to change that to this one. Preserve the nearest neighbor one. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, there you go. Um, so the mosaic filter is out. Scott was asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's it's one of those things where it's like it'll help. It might help if you kind of taking a photograph and you want to turn it into pixel art. It could help. Yep. Um, but again, like most things. If the computer goes like, cool, I got this, I'll handle it, it right. might not do exactly what you want it to. Yeah, you have less, much less control. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's better, you know, you might have less cleaning up to do if you just do it from scratch yourself. Cool. A couple of people from New Zealand. Nice to see New Zealand in the house again. Hey, Kane, how's it going? Um, don't forget that you can ask questions. If you guys are just joining in, jump into the live chat, um, log in with your Adobe ID and ask us some questions. So we're getting pretty knee deep into pixel art here. Yeah, yeah, really, really, really deep. Getting a bit nerdy and sort of techy with, with Photoshop. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. It's super cool. Um, and like I said, this is this for me makes sense because my artwork is often kind of a bit retro. Mm -hmm. It's very digital. So, again, it is it is technically stepping out of my comfort zone, but it's within the bounds of, like, without sounding a bit sort of corny, it's the universe that I've created for my artwork. Yep. Definitely. Um, so it fits that that method of working is like yeah this is cool this is super retro yeah and the outcome is always like yeah for a gamer and an 80s fan it's like yes <laughs> um so yeah so we're just kind of making sure that our selection is on a unticked anti-alias so that we get a nice pixelated horrible kind of shape that's what it. we want that's what we want um and then the pencil is also going to allow us to use single lines without getting what normally would happen with even a hard edge brush that is still one pixel you get this kind of blurry line because mm -hmm. photoshop is trying to hide those pixels so this is when you're using the paintbrush tool instead of the yes, pencil is that right. right yeah that's right excellent good to know okay so the eraser tool as well we'll use obviously because we'll want to erase stuff mm -hmm. um, but the eraser tool also has the same mode but it's just not actually a tool. It's in the options of that tool. So if you go to your eraser, by default, it'll be set on brush, mm -hmm. which will erase um, uh, oops, like this. Okay, so we're getting that same kind of color variation. Mm. If we set that to pencil, we'll be able to just delete nice, clean pixels. I like it a lot. So those are the three things that we're looking at, right? We've got 
the image interpolation is set to nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. preserve hard edges. We're using a pencil on the brush and the eraser. And we've got our selection tool, which is ticked on, unticked on anti-aliasing. Okay, step by step. Okay. So now we're ready to roll. We're ready to roll, pixel, right. pixel time. So let's do this. Um, step by step, bit by bit. So yeah, yeah, see what you did there. Um, so first things first is, you have to consider when you're starting your artwork is what size this is gonna be like, mm. all right? Again, I said size doesn't matter. That's the physical size of like, if you wanted to print this big, it doesn't matter. You can yeah. work tiny as you like. It's not gonna affect how big you can output that image, okay? But what it will affect is something like this. So I prepared this kind of little image for you guys um, to show this idea, right? That's cool. So these are the same for illustration, just one of them is done at 128 pixels wide. So this image here has 128 pixels across. This one is half of that. So it's against Moore's law. We go down by halves, mm -hmm. like all good computer nerds will know. That's what you get on your. Well, I think um, about is scan spaces. discs. I'm like yeah. 32, 64, 128. Exactly. I'm like 128. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, so 64, as you can see, like we've still got some level of detail. Mm -hmm but we're having to make some sacrifices. So for instance, the teeth on the skull are no longer there. The nose is gone as well. Mm. We're, we're losing some detail in the image, okay? Um, and that's, a, that's obviously a necessary sacrifice. 32 starts to get real spritey and pixely. Yeah, and I noticed that the, the cross is like a straight up cross. Yeah, yeah. again, because like, and it, it needs to be a bit bigger because otherwise it's too small and because the pixels can't get any smaller than one pixel. Yeah. It can't go sub-pixel if you want. Um, it has to be this kind of thing where, all right, again, sacrifices need to be made mm -hmm. on an illustrative point of view from yep. a design sense. Yep. And then 16 where it's just kind of like, all, right, all hell is broken loose, all the detail <laughs> is gone. But again, if you kind of consider that these are meant to be seen from a distance, those pixels kind of disappear and your eye kind of blends in the rest for your brain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, this is basically like favicon size or like real, real tiny in your kind of heads up display on a video game, but it makes sense. Mm. Except we're working at it at a really large scale with huge squares. And so we need to make the art make sense at scale. Perfect. So it gets real interesting when you think about it kind of that way. So before we start the artwork, you need to think about how much detail do you want to put into it, all right? So something like this is probably as detailed as I'd be happy to go because if you start moving into 256 territory, which mm -hmm. is obviously two times 128, mm -hmm. there comes a point where it's like, well, it's no longer really pixel art because we can't yeah. see the pixels anymore. It's just right. pixelated art. Right. Right? It's like, wow, Jeremy uploaded this to Instagram at the wrong yeah, resolution. Exactly. So yeah. then it kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. You want it to be relatively small. So you have those limitations on the visual and it looks that way as well. Yeah. Right. Um, so this one, if memory serves, that one's a huge file because I made it bigger. Again, I've, took, I've taken a, I think this one's 128 as well. I took a 128 file and put it into a 2000 pixel file without right. any resolution. Just loss. scaled it up. <laughs> so it's really cool because effectively I'm working as if I was an illustrator mm -hmm. and I never work in illustrator. So I'm forcing Photoshop to work as illustrator. And I was like, yes, take that. You're just having like such a good time doing this I am, yeah, stuff. So, I love it. Like, like, it's like, so much fun. I'm a bit nerdy, a bit geeky. Eyes are lighting like, up. Yeah. Um, yeah, Eriko <laughs> loves the 32. I like the 32 as yeah, well. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's fun. Like again, like the, the point of it is just that like, you know, it, it looks like pixel art. Yeah. Not too smooth. The 128 one is pushing it a little bit, I think. Mm. But as you said, like when you zoomed in quite a lot, you're like, oh yeah, that's pixel art is intentional. It looks really cool yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah, obviously the output is super important. So yeah, so we want to consider the output that we're doing it at. Um, this one obviously is quite large. So I've made this sketch with a Wacom um, as a sort of preparation for this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to take this and pop it into a 128 file. Okay. And then I will lose resolution. This drawing is going to get real messy real quick. Okay. All right. So let's make. So hopefully people have watched up to here. Otherwise they're going to log <laughs> in and just think, what? Yeah. What have I? Um, so let's make for? our 128 file. So we got 128 by 128. You want to make sure that's in pixels. I want to make sure that's in pixels, not millimeters <laughs> or anything else. Um, 300 DPI is fine. RGB because we're working for screen. Um, and 8-bit is also fine. 
So let's create that. All right, so we got this image. Um, then we're gonna take my sketch here and we're gonna grab that and paste it into my image. So again, now you can see because this image was created in a different um, image interpolation setting, mm -hmm. we're getting this happen. Right. All right. If I had set my settings to that, when I bring it in, I would see all the pixels and it would be all hard edges, which would be a bit weird, but yeah, it doesn't really matter because this sketch isn't going to be there in the end. So it's just to get it in there. But this is just your guide, isn't it? This yeah, part, yeah, this is just the uh, uh, something like this that is going to be easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm working on something like the 32-bit or the you know 16-bit potion or whatever, mm. then I probably don't really need a guide. Right. But this is a little bit more detailed, so it's going to need that. Um, I'm going to reduce that down to fit into my image, and you can. And you see, don't have to hold like, shift anymore. Uh, you don't have to hold shift anymore. No, I'm to holding that out. option so that it does it on both sides. Yep. So basically, like, it's just a nice little shortcut rather than do one corner and the next. If you hold down option, it just does everything everywhere from the center. Uh -huh. So it's just a bit easier. Um, so you can see here, it's already kind of screwed up my image a little bit. As soon as I hit return, it's going to be like, oh, okay, I've lost a lot of the detail. This like, is like pixel art I would have done when I was like graduating as a design student accidentally. Yeah. So this is what yeah. you want to avoid, right? The, well, and, wow, and like that's just things, slow res. Like, when you're trying to make mistakes on purpose, yeah. it's actually a lot harder to do. When it just happens right. naturally, it's like, yeah, this is how I do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can see that like my circle from my like little Japanese fan is now a potato. My skull is <laughs> like a strawberry. It's like... But it's uh, all good. A sad strawberry. Um, <laughs> a very sad strawberry. We've got a question from um, Jim. He said, so uh, is 128 by 128 your ideal working uh, for pixel art if you were going to do games? I so? would say so. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't work with games. Yeah. Um, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, if there's any games out there, sure. Um, I am thinking about doing animated GIFs as well for these things because mm. these are just crying to be animated as yeah. well, little like video game sprites. Yeah. Um, but at this stage, yeah, 128 is kind of my sweet spot. Now, 128 is just because, again, it's it's nerdy and it's geeky and it's like Moore's law of doubling every time. But if you wanted to do like 176, if that works better for you, mm. then like it's pixel art for its own sake. It's not pixel art for a digital medium like yeah. video game or whatever. So it doesn't have to have a specific text spec. Mm. But yeah, I find 128 in terms of that threshold in between. How detailed can you go and still keep it pixel art? 128 is It's a nice is little good. sweet spot. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, so we got this file now. It's in a sitting pretty in a 128. Um, I've got that on a layer for the purposes of clarity. I'm just going to call that sketch and lock it. And then I'm going to start creating a new layer and I'm going to create an outline. So there's a bunch of different ways that you could do these kind of things. Um, you can have outlines that are actually visible, like real proper kind of like manga style like this. So mm. all these kind of have like a nice outline around it. Or you can do slightly more kind of painterly vibe where the outlines are actually the color of the thing that they're outlining to a certain degree. Um, so again, that's purely kind of like a stylistic thing to, to think about. I've done another one just today as well, which is this one that has that same kind of vibe. So the outline of the little Salmon nigiri is just a darker nigiri. The rice is not really dark rice color, but what is dark rice color? Gray? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, so then, yeah, you can kind of think about outlines and everything. This one is going to have outlines simply because it's going to add to that kind of clarity, and I'm, I'm trying to make it kind of look a little bit manga as well, so that's good, really going to help me out. Um, because I'm working with a white background on this, I can see pixels where there's color, but not where there is not, I guess. Um, so I can turn on my pixel grid here, just as a guide to let me know where stuff's gonna fall. So just a quick little observation, because your pen is one pixel by one pixel, it turns into a square? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, well, because it's a it's pixel. So it is, yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah. Thought it could so have, again, could have this is why, like, you, if you paint with a brush, you'll notice that my brush is round, even though it's one pixel wide. Exactly. That's yeah. why when it does it, you can see here that it's actually created a kind of like a weird light gray on either side. Yeah. Because it's Photoshop trying to make a square into a circle. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's a good analogy. All right. So we're gonna kind of look at this um, and think about 
where does this go? Now, the other thing, the other consideration that we need to think about is when we're making a, like, let's make a perfect circle, for instance, right? So we're holding down shift on the selection and we're going to make a perfect circle. What you'll notice, if I turn off that horrible grid, is that I've got a steady kind of stream that's even everywhere. So I've got um, six pixels, three, one, 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 three, six. All right, so that's six, that's three, that's one, 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 three, and then six. What you want to avoid is getting stuff like this where it's just all over the place. Yeah. Right? Um, that's bad kind of pixel work. So, for instance, if you're doing a diagonal line and you get something like that, that's no good. Mm. Right? No bueno. You want something that's going to be nice. And because you're trying to do art as if it was done by a computer, it needs to be not random and nice and even. And you're also noticing that my pixels are kind of snapping to places where I'm not necessarily going. Again, because I can't have, I can't paint here because that's half pixels. You mean, yeah, at the intersection so of those. If I click here, it's going to take the one that I'm in the most, even mm. if it's only by a little bit, and mm. fill that one. So it snaps to a specific pixel rather than exactly where I put it which is another thing I got to contend with when I'm doing this, right? But essentially, you want to try wherever possible to get this nice kind of even line, even if that means that you're doing like three, one, three, one, or like three, right. two, three, two, like whatever angle you need to get is what you're going to try and sort of do here. So there's bad pixels and there's good pixels, I guess, mm -hmm. like Space Invaders. Um, all right, so let's get going. Again, I'm using uh, my mouse here. I can turn smoothing on. It's not necessarily going to do very much at this stage. Smoothing just means that like, it takes away the coffee factor from your handshake. Right. Um, but the cool thing about this is that I can either try and draw a smooth line, like a continuous line to like draw her horn, right? And so that's one solid line. Or I can go by my drawing and just click and click away and sort of, you know, try and start doing this thing where it's, all right, cool, that's nice and even, that's working out for me. And then I can go back down to, uh, and I might go to here and then two back down. Do you know what I mean? So I could do that and have a look at kind of how that works. But because I'm working with pixels and because it's gonna be super easy, it's probably gonna be a bit easier for me to do the bad one and then come back and fix it later on. Right. right? This so, is like one of those efficiency things that you have a negotiation with yourself in terms yeah, of time. You're yeah, like, all right, exactly. it's actually going to be more efficient for me to do it, get it out, get some stuff done, and then come back in and refine it yep. rather than... Yeah, especially like if you consider this is one undo in Photoshop. If I had to do that, then I'm not going to be able to undo the whole thing and I'm going to be there for ages while I undo oh, each yeah. and every single one of the pixels. Yeah, that could drive you mad pretty yeah. quick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But see here, like for instance, from a distance, that's that horn is going to look like there's a bit of a point there. Hmm. So that's no good. So I need to come back in here with my pencil eraser and just do that. And that, this is again one of those fascinating things for me where that difference has turned that horn from a sharp one to a circle. Like right. Your eye kind of fills in the rest. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just sort of continue doing this, trying wherever possible to get a nice even. So that's four. So I'll try and do three and then another three and then another three and then maybe two, 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 all this kind of stuff. And mm. then back down to like one and then start again going down the other way. So three, four, five, and we get a nice right. kind of even curve on the hair. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah? I like it. Um, all right, so let's kind of jump ahead a little bit. Let's go back into this one. Um, and you'll see that I've got my kind of outline here all done. I've Because it's me, I've put neon colors all over it as well. Um, but that's my standard outline at this stage. So it looks like there's some gray in within that black. Yeah, so that's... That's me kind of, because I haven't been doing this for super long, it's um, it's kind of just done some strange things to me as a little bit, right? So that's, that's a little bit of a problem, which I can then go in and fix. Mm -hmm. um, and because this illustration is actually at size, I'm gonna have a bit of an issue with that. So let me go into this one instead. There we go, that's a bit better. 
So then I've got that in there like that, but if I come back in with my pen, I can just fill those. Right. And again, this is where it's really cool because I can actually redraw stuff without needing to be super precise. Yeah. And it's just, I can just click on the pixels that I already filled up. And so it's really awesome. You just completely take over the pixel. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that's really cool is that all of a sudden the magic wand in Photoshop is like super useful. All right. Right. Because okay. the magic wand has always been this kind of negotiation between you and Photoshop of like how many pixels do you want me to select because I'm going to do the soft edge. How mm. far do you go? And you get this like weird white edge on the on the side of it. With pixel art, these are basically like little vector shapes. So I'm only ever going to select those pixels because mm. those pixels now exist and they're apparent so i can actually click on them which is just like yes this is fantastic mm. all right um which also means that if i don't want to work with any layers for some reason i can come into here and just select that fill the mouth with a specific color and it's going to fill that mouth perfectly that is a time saver any outline around yeah it. that's cool all right so again, I can work with that. If I want to change that color a little bit later on, I can come back in and select it, or I can go back into my image adjustments and say replace color. And replace color is like the magic wand. It's always been this negotiation mm -hmm. of like, how far do you go into that gradient? But because there are no gradients here, I don't have to have that negotiation. I, right. I win every time. Um, so that it's, it's really kind of, again, it's a completely different way of working for me um, with this mm. um, and it just means that I can kind of try different things and see how it all works so um, let me undo that so then yeah I'll, I'll still create layers as you can see all right so I'm still working in a relatively similar way to what I would work normally so I've got a layer for the skin right okay so you kind of outline skin clothing yeah, yeah. accessory so kind I, of like I, building the layers just because in. it's easier than having to do a magic wand selection or going into replace color it's easier and faster if it's on a separate layer right but if for some reason your cat walks across your keyboard and magically flattens your image and Every saves time. it and closes and quits and turns off your computer mm. good, that can happen yeah um then you still can do the stuff that you want to with with pixel art so mm. um yeah, so from here on in, it's just going to be me kind of thinking about, you know, doing the same process that I would normally do with my, like, smooth, buttery line work where I'm using, um, on a particular layer, I'll play around with, like, hue saturation, so command U, and kind of, you know, see how demony do I want to make her, how red is her skin going to be. So I can, you know, mess around with those things in the same way. Um, her kimono is on a separate layer. I'd probably do more layers than this if I was doing kind of, like, real work, but... Um, yeah. It's cool. Right? You'll notice as well that, and I did try and do this in my sketch, which is here, she's got kind of like a mesh network stockings, kind mm -hmm. of like ninja style. Because the resolution here is what it is, I can't do that. Just didn't work. It, it won't, it won't go for it, right? The other thing is one of the considerations that you need to think about is like, for instance, if you're trying to make a cross, mm -hmm. right, you can't have it just be two pixels wide. You need it to be at least three so that there needs to be a middle pixel. Right. If there's two, then you're just going to end up with something like that. Right. So you need to have something in the middle. So therefore, if I'm making an X, for instance, right, that X needs to be the same thing. It needs to be at least three mm. if i try and do this then it's just going to be a cube yep all right so that's one of the issues that i had with these kind of stockings trying to do them is all right i could go here and i could try and do this right and see how that kind of will work out and that might work but it's not necessarily what i'm trying to do i want to kind of show some of the volume of the leg so i don't want to just be completely straight mm. so i want to go like this. Yeah, because that would look quite flat if you did the whole thing. Right? Yeah, a little bit. So I can then go down into here. But then because my leg is the way that it is, if I follow that down, I've got one continuous line all the way down. That's going to look real weird and chunky. Mm. So again, I've had to kind of make a sacrifice on the actual image itself and the artwork itself compared to what I would have normally sketched mm. because I'm working with pixel art. Yeah. Which, again, can be a little bit sort of frustrating to work with. But 
then them's the breaks. That's mm-hmm. that's the price you pay for kind of working with pixel art. I like that it makes you make a decision as well. Yeah. So it's just like, all right, okay, well, you, you either can or you can't do it. Yep. Okay, you can't do it. Well, you can't do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you need to think about something else and it kind of maybe pushes you to create stuff that you wouldn't normally create. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, so other than that, like some of the, the the previous live streams that I've done with you guys, I've kind of gone through my color process and how I paint. Mm. From here on in, it would pretty much be kind of the same thing. Right. With maybe fewer colors, right? So I'd still work with highlights. I'd still work with all this kind of stuff, but just the the amount of colors and detail that I would put in would be less because, again, it's meant to be pixel art. It's not mm. meant for com- computers that can kind of compute larger images. For, the, for those that haven't seen the other live streams, like where do you get your color palette from? Like, do you have particular rules about it, like certain amount of colors, or do you have, at, you know, um, any... Like um, reference stuff that you use because you do you do have like a particular style but none of your work looks the same but it looks like it's from the same universe or the same yeah. family right yeah um so this is my website so as you can see it's kind of like a lot of you know pink and neon lots of really really bright colors mm. um i used to work specifically in black and white back in my college days five hundred thousand years ago um and now i've kind of really gone into color but i the, the thing that I like about the 80s is obviously some of the aesthetic and some of my illustrations can be quite 80s and have, you know, visible kind of 80s references in them. Mm. But the main thing that I will do with the 80s is the color palette and the neons, right? Um, my stuff is a little bit kind of like, it's a bit kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what it is, but I've kind of put it down to basically if you took... Um, Shogun Assassin and brought it into Blade Runner universe. Right. That's, that's what my work looks like a little bit. It's kind of like Japanese neon 80s. And mm-hmm. I'm talking about like Blade Runner 1 with Harrison Ford. Um, so my colors kind of come from that. Um, and as you can see, like a lot of my work has that kind of neon vibe to it with a lot of colors. Um, so working with my kind of pixel art, you know, again, you, you get this thing where you can see that I'm still using the same colors and it's still kind of the same aesthetic and still looks like my work. Um, but I'm trying to work in a kind of a different way because I think it's important not to be too defined by your medium. Yeah, totally. Um, this kind of medium definitely defines how your artwork looks. That's mm. the whole point of the medium. But compared to what I normally do, it's a nice kind of change up. And again, I probably will go back to the smooth lines and then go back to pixels and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, But yeah, something like this can be really kind of fun to do where you put the colors and how you work with stuff and the constraints that it offers you. Um, But yeah, those those are the kind of the the colors that I will work with. I'll still kind of play around with everything and see, you know, what... um, what works best, what's the different kind of color backgrounds. As you saw before, I did actually do a version where I added neons to this. Mm-hmm. And and because I'm adding neons, that requires me to do a darker background because as we've kind of gone through before um, on the show, it's this idea that, you know, light doesn't exist if it's nighttime. Like you don't see a neon sign lit up during the day as much. Right. It requires nighttime to really pop. Um, so then I will do these kind of stuff where it's just like, yeah, cool, these neons, and then I'll animate this into a GIF, and it'll be kind of interesting to see how that goes. So you could have the light off camera kind of turning yeah, on or exactly. like flashing a like little she's bit. she's standing and next to like a neon sign or something. Like that's yeah. super, super, super basic animation. What I'd really love to do is be able to kind of like pull out her sword and like swish, swish. Sort of like, sit there for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Then. Yeah. Um, that'd be really cool. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's, there is all this kind of stuff, but one of the other things that I will tend to work with every now and then is gradients Mm -hmm. and gradients are a fake thing. Gradients don't exist in the digital world. Gradient is just an illusion of a gradient, Uh right? So when you're working again with like pixel art, um, where's our file here? If we do a kind of like a gradient on this, uh, let's say that we're going to go from like red to white. 
I feel like if no one's ever used Photoshop before, this is a great introduction because it's just like, hey, this is how Photoshop was built. Yeah. It's like, hey, by the way, this is how pixels work. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, and it's and it's kind of interesting to like go back Revisit. to like, yeah. The, yeah. the worker bees of digital art, which is pixels. Yeah. And, like, we're always, or at least I've always been really concerned with the trying soldiers. to hide that as much as possible, putting Seven. a nice kind of like chassis on the engine. It's mm. nice to just kind of strip everything back and let's see all the cogs and the gears and everything else. Mm. It's kind of like that. Mm. Uh, I suppose it appeals to my like male kind of how stuff works kind of right. sense, but yeah. Um, JB was asking what music do you listen to, like synthwave? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, just yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly what you listen to. Um, okay, cool. Every now and then if I'm working on a piece for something else, like a video game, I'll listen to the soundtrack from that video game as well, just to, to get nice into, oh, the, yeah. into the mood. You can get like, um, like the the 8-bit and 16-bit yeah. like versions of the yep. games as yeah. well, like in the background. Like 8-bit so Game cool. of Thrones kind of, yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I will amazing. listen to a lot of 80s music as well. I think my two longest playlists are Synthwave and 80s on my um, Spotify. Wow. Um, but yeah, so co to come back to this, what we're looking at here is the illusion of a gradient. Mm. So it looks like a nice smooth gradient from a distance, um, which it is, and mm -hmm. that's Photoshop. But in reality, from a technical aspect, each and every single one of these squares is a slightly different color every single time, getting lighter and lighter. Mm. And you can see that as I go, the ring on the bottom is kind of changing colors as it goes. Yeah. So that's one of the problems. So the way we get around this, and again, you could do a gradient like this, and this is, you know, this is my 128 pixel file, so the gradient will still work, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look like pixel. Yeah. So what we do is we do this thing called dithering. Cool. So dithering sounds like something a little bit funny and weird, but essentially it's this. This is dithering. This right? takes me back. This is this like reminds yeah. me of Game Boy. Yes. Um, yeah. Like Parallax. Is yeah. This this is like Pokemon, the original Pokemon. Yeah. Or like this like this one is kind of like Afterburner. It's like the sky, like it right. was all the arcade game. So it's it's this idea that essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna not have these as many steps but we're gonna kind of spread out the steps in almost a kind of like a half tone pattern that just gets less yeah. and less as it goes mm. and up close it doesn't look like much but from a distance again that's how pixel art is meant to be seen because it's small mm. it looks like a super smooth gradient mm. all right um so one of the kind of the cool things to do with um dithering is essentially the way you do this is like this so we've got one layer here, which mm -hmm. is going to be our base color. So sorry, just before we jump into that, we've got a couple of questions. So why don't we take a break, and then we'll jump into the dithering. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got a question. Um, what's your view about the contrast, as in black against white, um, like um, when you're playing with color? Um, so all right, so with I'm, I rarely ever work with black and white. Right. But I think contrast is super key. So one of the things that I will do when I'm working with color is I'll try and get um, what we call a kind of a, a complementary scheme. So when you're mm -hmm. working with complementary colors, right? So black and white are obviously opposite colors. This is the color wheel I learned about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I should have. Been, yeah. I wasn't paying attention. Um, <laughs> but you want to play with yeah with the complementary color of that. So like if you're using red, you might want to think about using green because it's right. the opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? Um, yellow is purple, blue is orange, all this kind of stuff. Up is down, black is best. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so you want to get that level of contrast. So a lot of the artwork that I will do, as you guys can see, like this is, you know, basically a complementary color scheme because I've got the green and I've got this vivid pink, which is like going towards red. Yeah. Um, so that is going to make it really, really pop. Um, the purple is in there just because green and purple are really nice colors to work with in that kind of horror sense. But a lot of the artwork that you will see on my website will have this thing where I use this kind of 60-30-10 um, rule. Oh, yeah. Cool. Explain that. So 60-30-10 is, is actually uh, an interior design kind of principle where if you're designing a house, you want 60% one thing, 30% another thing, and then 10% of like a bit of mustard to pick up the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so how that works is on something like, uh, let's say, let's say something like this, right? So we got this image, and we've got 60% pink and red and kind of that warm color. 
We've got 30% blue, so the hair is blue, the neon is blue. In this instance, I've made, actually I would normally make the 10% the neon color, because that, that's the thing that's gonna pick the whole thing that's up. That's your accent, that's yeah. your, yeah. yeah. But in this one, the yellow is my 10%. Right. All right, so that just kind of generates contrast, and then I've got it over here. And you can see that I've now added more colors. This is no longer 60, 30, 10. Um, it still has contrast because I've got a black and I've got a dark color and a light color, but that neon pops a little bit less now, mm. right? Uh, over here, it really does stand out a lot more because the blue and the, the pink are quite sort of opposite colors as well. Um, so I, I like to try and sort of do this kind of stuff a lot where there will be, you know, one color that just picks up the whole rest of it and just makes it really pop as a whole. Mm. So these are all just kind of these little heads that I did as color exercises again. So we've got dark colors and then a really bright color to come in and pick that up. Same thing here, same thing over here. We went through this one last time. Yeah. Um, so yes, there's a, there's a lot of kind of toing and froing for me in the, in the color um, when I'm working on it. So I'll spend a lot of time when I'm working on something like this. Uh, where is it? Where is she? Here she is. Um, doing, you know, playing around with my tonal range and mm -hmm. seeing like, hey, what works here? Like, I'll, I'll know it when I see it, kind of. It's a little bit maybe cheating. It's like, hey, you know what? That kind of looks cool, but it's too much pink. Right. But now it's kind of getting lost a little bit. The image is difficult to read from a distance because it's all overall too pink. Yeah. So you need that contrast in here. The blue is working because it's kind of echoing the purple of the, um, the leggings. Um, that's working even better. If I go too much, then the highlight doesn't work anymore. So it's like, fix this, this now gets broken. Right. right? So there's all, for me, this um, I spend a lot of time staring at this HUSAT panel because... You're dreaming yeah, in the hue oh, saturation man, panel. Like, um, it's, it's the bane and savior of my life, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's a, that was a great question. Um, so there's a couple other ones as well. Um, where were we? Um, yeah, Kane was asking, um, how do you think of what to create, like specifically what you want to draw? Um, so that that comes from my thing of like... I watch TV in the 80s. <laughs> in the Blade Runner, yeah. So there's, there's like... That could be like a whole another kind of live stream episode. Yeah, totally. Like, and, yeah. and Jesse was talking about that, like where do you get your inspiration from? Yeah. Where does it kind of feed? For me, it feeds definitely from gaming, mm -hmm. um, from manga, yeah, uh, from Japanese culture as well, which is kind of manga, but slightly sort of... I, I do like the manga, which is the kind of modern pop culture, but I also really like the traditional, yeah. super kind of lot of customs and traditions in sort of traditional Japanese culture. Mm. Um, but then on the contrast of that is this kind of thing of old and new. So that's one of the main themes of my work is this kind of like old, super traditional geishas and samurai lit in like Blade Runner cyberpunk mm. light. And so it's old and the new, the kind of the, the blend of those two is something that really interests me, which again is, it makes sense for me to do pixel art in that realm because it's an old technique mm. with new equipment. Right. And so then it's like, yeah, I think it's, there's something really kind of that appeals to me a lot. Yeah, and I guess like it's what you're into, right? So like yeah. whatever you're, whatever you, I guess you're into, like should feed yeah. into what you're doing because then it's, doesn't feel like work, right? Like yeah, if exactly. If you're into muscle cars or something, then yeah, precisely. And I think the, the really cool thing with pixel art as well is that it affords me this thing where I can. Sorry, I'm kind of switching between windows a lot here, but cool. Um, my my work traditionally has heaps of detail into it. I'll get really kind of I'll nerd out on something and start adding heaps and heaps of different things like. This one, for instance, will have like stuff on the patches that are references to things and games and stuff. And you got to right. kind of like dissect it, which is fun. I really like doing it. And I think a lot of people kind of like spending a little bit of time with the work that's there because it's like, oh, mm. there's always a little bit more happening that you didn't notice at first. Mm. With pixel art, I can't do that. And so it tends to be a, a lot more kind of straightforward in that sense. So. Mm. I'll usually spend sort of 10, 20, 30, 50 hours on a piece, whereas this is turning around in like a day. Yeah. Because it's just like, cool, fine. I, there's and, there's and only so much I can do yeah, with this yeah. before it starts to just get a little bit messy. I like the little the detail in the cork, like how the cork's starting to crack. Yeah. Did well to get that in. Yeah. 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 And again, like this would be easy to do. And this is 128. At 128, that's fine. 256, that's even easier. If I brought this down to like 64, 32 yeah. or 16, mm. No. Yeah. Right. And then you look at the cork on the 16 one, it's like it's 
three colors, the shading, the meat, and then the outline. Mm. There's no little kind of divots and things like there are on the other ones. Yeah. Because, again, that sacrifice needs to be made. But, yeah, for, for what I like to draw, it's usually something Japanese, usually neon colors, and maybe some cyberpunk in there as well, just to, for good measure. Yeah, um, why not? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, let's get back to the, the dithering, which was super cool. So, yeah, so we got... Um, how are we going for time? Yeah, so that's, that'll probably just wrap us up. So we got this... Yeah, so actually, um, sorry, I'm totally interrupting you, but yes, um, so we will finish up in the next, like, 5, 10 minutes. Uh, so if you do have any questions, now's the time to ask. We'll go through some of this dithering stuff, and then if there are some questions in the chat, yeah. we'll get back to it before we wrap things up. So make sure you do ask your questions now as we yeah. go. Dither away. All right, so dithering, uh, pretty, pretty sort of straightforward and simple. Um, we're going to sort of build this up in a way that's going to allow us to... Um, reuse it and just change colors without having to redraw it every single time mm, cool. um so what i just did there this is the main one that i did and then i'm going to duplicate it over and make it a bit darker duplicate it make it a bit darker duplicate it, and so on and so forth all right um so how i did that basically is i'm just going to make a simple block so i just dragged a selection across this with my rectangle selection tool just do that fill mm -hmm. it okay what's the shortcut again for that uh, for fill, fill? yeah uh option delete fills with my foreground color. Mm -hmm. uh, command delete fills with my background color. Cool. Cool. All right. Make sure you're holding that option because if you just hit delete, you're just going to delete. You have a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've made this um, little thing here. And what I'm going to do now is this is where it might get a little bit sort of tedious, but I'm actually going to put this on a new layer and I'm going to go one, two, three. Okay. Then... Because I want to just save time, I'm just going to take these guys, duplicate them over, take, uh, what do we got here? One, two. I'm going to join these together. So I select them both, Command E, and then I can take six and duplicate them over. And now I've got 12. Join those two guys again, and 12 to 24. Again, we're talking about Moore's Law, um, and so on and so forth. Right. So does anything I happen if you get two pixels on the same pixel? Doesn't matter, right? Like, oh, no, like no, just then if you, again, again, like it doesn't it just matter fills up the whole just, pixel. they perfectly overlap. Right. Right? Yep. So, yeah. So you can just work really fast as well because what exactly. you see is what you get yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, precisely. You're working with the, like, it doesn't get any smaller than that. That's right? mm. so what I was saying. It's like quantum pixels. Like you're, you're in so deep that you're like, yeah, you've become a pixel essentially. Such a lack of detail that it's full, <laughs> full of detail. Yeah. All right, so that'll that'll do for now. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you know what? It won't do for now. Let's do this properly. It's doing the whole thing. All good. Done. Could that just be like a really nice, relaxing way to illustrate? It, yeah, I guess, yeah, it can be, especially if you're kind of doing it with a mouse. It's just like one by one. Mm. It's super, like, stress-free. It's super, like straightforward you don't mm. need to think about much just put the pixels where they belong really. yeah it's paint by numbers in it's like most obvious form because mm. it's literally like here's a bunch of squares put colors in them it's like a coloring book yeah <laughs> um so now we're going to take this one and we're going to duplicate him too move him up one and then over one right right so i've started making this thing now where there's the white is like creeping into this and i could make it even more than that if i wanted to um and that's going to be that one there. And what we're going to do now is we're going to join these two guys together. And I want to do another one, again, using my pencil brush. I want to do every other pixel. So I'm building these little pyramids, essentially. All right? I could do this on a separate layer, but again, like, whatever. Let's just do that the old school way. And whether we're building this and so on and so forth. Right, and then last one is I'm gonna pop one right here. So lonely now. I can turn on my grid if I want to, okay, to see where my pixel is actually gonna sit, so I don't have to kind of guess where it's going. And that'll probably do us. I'm gonna take these two guys, and I'm just gonna take all of this. And use that as a basis. There we go. So now I've got my kind of dithering ready to go. Yeah. 
And I'm going to flip this. Okay. And then I'm going to duplicate again. Go to Command U. Drop the darkness of it. And move it up. Same thing again. Move it up. Drop the darkness. It's cool. And I've made this kind of like dithering pattern quite quickly and with full control over all the colors, right? And again, it looks real shonky right now, but that's the point. Mm, yeah. and, and from a distance, it, it'll look smooth. But again, the, the point is that you get this kind of dithering. So how much you do that kind of dithering is also up to you. Like if I really wanted to, I could have gone into my layer here and started erasing some of these guys out to blend even more white into it and make even kind of a smoother gradient. But again, like, you, you want to be careful how smooth you go on this because right. smooth is the enemy of pixel art. Um, so, yeah, you just kind of, like, measure how much you're kind of putting into it. And this mm. this is more than enough, really, to, to go on. Um, again, if I wanted to start, start, you know, making even more kind of gradients here, I could start duplicating that over and bring that into like another color. So let's start sort of fading this into like a, a green. You know what I mean? Yep. Very cool. That's it. That's sweet. Yeah. So yeah, so again, just to kind of recap, um, the main things that we want to look at with all of this is the image interpolation mm -hmm. needs to be set to this sort of standard of um, not bicubic automatic, which is what you normally want mm. in every other scenario in Photoshop. This one, we want the preserve hard edges. Um, we want anti-aliasing to be set on all of our selection tools. So that needs to be unticked, right, um, up here. And then we also want to be using the pencil brush and the eraser set to pencil, not brush. Right. Those are the main things. Those are the main steps? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. When you start kind of playing around with all of this and you might want to resize things, the last thing that you might want to know is if I resize this now, it may, uh, didn't do it this time, but in your transform tool, when you hit Command T, you'll notice that you've got interpolation set there as well. Normally it's set on by cubic automatic. And if I do that now, potentially it will do, yeah, see now it's made it all blurry. Right. So you don't want that. So mm. when you're kind of playing around with your image, you want to make sure that if you're going to rescale it down or up, mm. that you're set to the image. Uh, sorry, the image interpolation of that transform needs to be set to the same setting. Right. That's regardless of whether your file is set to that. Your file can stay by cubic automatic. Would you often be resizing things, or would you always? Because at the beginning, you sort of said it's kind of important to know where you need to go at the very beginning yeah. of the project, so you know yeah. sort of how to build it. I think. I wouldn't because this is what happens. Something as simple as this. Uh, actually, hang on. Let me undo that. Uh, show me my pixels, please. So something as simple as the cross, right? Five pixels wide. When I start to edit this, you see what happens when I rotate it? It's going a little bit kind of funky. It's got a mind of its own. Yeah. So that, if I rotate it 45 degrees, will not just create a cross, it'll just do this weird thing. Right. So resizing, because we're working with pixels and because we're doing kind of funny things with Photoshop, when I take this guy and resize it, you'll notice that that dithering doesn't just do the same thing. Yeah. It goes kind of a little bit hectic. Mm. Essentially, because what I've done normally here is these are pixels. If I make it smaller, it can't make that pixel smaller than one pixel. Right. So it has to make a new illustration from it. Mm. And the computer's like, and kind of has a bit of a brain. It's like, ah, uh, something like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, would, I wouldn't try and sort of rescale things too much because again, up or down, it's going to start doing weird things yep. to your image because yep. you're working with pixels, single pixel at a time. Mm. Therefore, it can't make bigger, it can't make smaller. It has to do other. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. So good. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, in the chat. We've got a couple of questions to take us out. 
Um, so Jim was asking for my students, hey, you're a teacher, that's awesome. Um, Jeremy, how many hours do you think you put in to becoming a good pixel artist? Uh, so far, not very many. Yeah, like and this I is... I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a good pixel artist just yet. Um, I think, but I think, you know what, it's like everything else. It's like, how many hours do you put in to be a good Photoshop digital artist? It's like half an hour. Right. But before that was like 10,000 hours of becoming good at drawing. Yeah. I'm just using a different tool now. Totally. So the, the, the pixel art hasn't necessarily made me do, made like changed me from better or worse. It's just a different tool that I'm using. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of like, it's offering different challenges and it's meaning that I work in a different way. But, I, and yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a good pixel artist just yet. Mm. Um, it's just my illustrations done in pixel art. Yeah, yeah. So it's all the illustration work in the decades yeah. leading up to, yeah. oh, hey, I'm going to give pixel art a go, where a lot of that gives you the authority and the knowledge to, yeah. to understand this is working, this isn't working. So it's that kind of, That's right. it's in your DNA a little bit. Yeah. Um, so it pro I guess it probably depends. For students, it depends, like, you know, what they're, you know, how you know, how much his how much experience they have as designers or, or students already as illustrators, how confident they are in other mediums, yeah. I guess, how familiar they are. But I guess in terms of the tools, it's, Pretty simple, as you saw. Yeah, ex exactly. Well, and it's, and I think that's specific to to pixel art. So we've got. Um, I think Jim was saying like, don't tell my students it only took half an hour. But I think right. if if one of the some of the previous episodes of this live stream that we've done, like mastering those tools and getting the right strokes and everything, that's obviously a lot more work. Yeah. But this is literally just like click and point, just fill squares with color. Mm. Um, and so the as you guys saw, the the techniques are really quite straightforward. Yeah. It's just then it's how do you come up with the image that you're going to create? Mm. That's a whole other discussion. But yeah. the technical aspect of it is actually really straightforward. Yeah, cool. Perfect answer. Let's see if I can dig some of these questions out. Um, so uh, Georgina was asking, is pixel art largely for fun or character designs or are there more client-related uses that you found? Uh, at this stage, because I've only been doing it a very short while, mm -hmm. um, I am just really just doing it for fun. If, if I get a commission like this for a client um, on an indie game or whatever that requires pixel art, then yeah, fantastic. I'm mm. totally down for that. But as far as my sort of career has gone up to this point, I, I can't foresee a lot of the clients that I currently work with yep. wanting something like that. Mm. Um, I think because the, yeah, the applications of... Uh, a, it's, it's, I think it's too specific to gaming. It's too much of a reference to 8-bit and old school and gaming yep. that, you know, clients like um, sort of bigger clients might not necessarily want to use it too much because it's very, mm. very specific and distinctive of a certain kind of type of yeah. look and feel. Yeah, and, and it's, it's also like not super mainstream, right? Like, which no. I guess is what you're getting yeah. at. So it's like, you know, the commercial work is often what pays the bills as well so it's like yeah Although, i got this in, in saying that i do i follow this account um these guys in england called i love dust and they have just amazing stuff and they work right. with nike a lot and they just did this awesome campaign with um nike with michael jordan and it looks like nba jam from back in the days it's real pixely the animations are real like they've done all that on purpose and it's like oh my god that is so cool um, so there is maybe that kind of starting to come mm. up and and yeah but at, at this stage it's mostly just like let's have a go this will be yeah. fun and it appeals to my like geeky nerdy gamey side so yeah me too <laughs> um, that's awesome so um, for those that missed the beginning we actually we actually started a new um, sort of segment on Adobe Live which is Creative Challenge <laughs> which is where you can learn with us um, and so we've actually got Jeremy in as kind of our resident for this month um, who's coming in and taking a step-by-step -step how you can create your own digital illustrations. Um, yeah. And so maybe we'll just reiterate that. So if you guys are interested in Jeremy's process and how he does everything, um, at 1 o'clock every Wednesday for April, we're going to go through part one, part two, part three. Yep. Um, of a step-by-step -step process of your traditional, uh, traditional digital yep. art process, if that's a word. Um, and throughout each step, we're also, Jeremy's going to also review um review the submissions as well. So um, you can do it with Jeremy. And then at the end, uh, maybe I'll join you on the show as well. Yep. And we'll yep. do a review of everyone that submitted something. Um, and we're also going to be offering some portfolio reviews. So if you have some illustration, um, Jim, if you've got students that are into illustration, they can submit their portfolio um, and we'll review them mm. live. Yeah. So just uh, just quickly again, I might just pull up what we were kind of going through cool. um, in case people are interested. But 
Um, today we kind of looked at sort of taking an image that's been scanned in a mole scan with mm. lots of kind of defaults and you know papers in the edge of the sketchbook and the drawings incomplete and turning it into this okay so something that's ready to be um, digitized uh, the end result will essentially be kind of taking that drawing and making it digital so this is more my traditional kind of yeah. old school smooth lines no pixels um, so yeah that's the that's the gist of part one two and three is getting from this to that yeah essentially awesome and yeah. you can use the templates that we've provided as well so if they're not super confident illustrators that's okay they can still follow the yep. digital steps of things um, but bonus points if some if you know they use their own illustrations scan them in and then follow the steps from there as well yeah yeah cool Awesome. All right. Well, we'll be back actually at one <clears> o'clock <throat> next week with Jeremy Lord. Um, and then we also have our typical live stream at two o'clock with Alex LaHour as one of your mates. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be really cool. Alex has got some really, really awesome work. Very sort of different way of working. He uses Illustrator mostly, where yep. I don't touch Illustrator. So yeah, I'm keen to even ask him a few questions myself. So it should be good. It's going to be good. All right. We'll, we'll see you all then. Uh, thank you, everyone, in the chat. Good to see some familiar faces in there. And we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in.